Bonsoir, bonsoir à tous. Merci d'être venu donc à cette quatrième édition de la Merkel Conférence, co-organisée par Eureka Certification et Accenture France. Ce soir, on a l'honneur d'inviter le docteur Sevdin Hamos. La conférence est en anglais, on commence une introduction en français. Euh, et, euh, et donc euh, voilà, je suis très ravi euh, de, vous, euh, de vous voir euh, ce soir et j'espère que vous allez passer euh, une excellente euh, soirée. Donc euh, on va commencer par euh, accueillir Yves Bernard euh, d'Accenture euh, qui va nous présenter aussi un peu euh, ce qui se fait dans le milieu euh, de la blockchain chez Accenture. Voilà, merci. Bonsoir. Alors, je ne suis pas sûr que je vais répondre à toute la question que je viens d'entendre. Mais en, fait, en tout cas, ce que je voulais dire, là, que je, il m'avait été demandé de, de sponsoriser la soirée. Et, et donc, je m'occupe de, des activités technologiques d'Accenture en Europe. Et on a, une, on a une stratégie qui est toujours d'accompagner nos clients sur la transformation digitale. Vous avez dû voir ça un peu dans les médias, droite à gauche, là, notamment dans la semaine où pas mal de patrons d'entreprise étaient invités chez Macron pour discuter de tech for good, enfin de technologie en général. Donc, on avait notre... Pierre Nanterme, qui est le CEO d'Accenture, qui était présent avec les différents autres dirigeants, Microsoft, SAP et autres. Et dans notre stratégie, on a une... la volonté qu'on a, c'est d'accompagner le client à faire une rotation vers le new, et euh, qu'on appelle donc interactive, mobility, analytics, cloud, sécurité. Bon, ça peut paraître un peu old maintenant pour certains, mais voilà, pour certains clients, c'est encore un peu de travail. Et euh, donc certains sont dans la salle, donc je remercie d'être présents, parce qu'on travaille ensemble pour vraiment être le plus possible en amont ensemble, et notamment on travaille sur les sujets les plus récents. Donc l'intelligence artificielle, on a fait beaucoup d'investissements ensemble avec des clients depuis un an. On a monté une practice d'à peu près 500 personnes en France, donc c'était vraiment des gros investissements. Et donc euh, intelligence artificielle, blockchain et réalité merci sont vraiment les trois derniers axes d'investissement qu'on fait. Et donc je ne parlerai pas de réalité merci, mais sur la blockchain, on est vraiment maintenant dans cette phase d'ascension. Et concrètement, en fait, euh, aujourd'hui, vous êtes tous des experts, mais il y a vraiment des premiers projets qui se lancent. Donc on a à peu près une dizaine, une quinzaine de projets constamment qui sont en route, qui sont encore des petits projets, mais qui en fait ont une... C'est ce qui est extraordinaire avec euh, la blockchain, c'est qu'on peut vraiment mettre en place des solutions qu'on ne faisait pas avant. Donc on, on casse des, 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 des frontières entre des industries pour vraiment automatiser la relation, sur des, soit du paiement, donc soit on va parler de bitcoin, mais euh, on le voit sur plein, plein de processus qui permettent de connecter tout un écosystème de supply chain, où on utilise différentes technologies qui permettent de connecter euh, des distributeurs, euh, des acheteurs, enfin tout, tout l'écosystème d'une euh, supply chain. Donc euh, pour nous, c'est au-delà de l'intérêt technologique hein, de s'investir dans les nouvelles techs, c'est pour créer des, nou des nouveaux modèles économiques pour nos clients et leurs partenaires. Donc euh, notre anticipation, c'est que ça va être une croissance absolument ex exceptionnelle, à la fois sur les compétences requises, mais aussi sur les projets qui, feront, qui seront des vraies transformations digitales pour nos clients, pas eux seuls, mais tout leur écosystème d'un coup. Donc euh, on a déjà vu des premiers projets euh, à Singapour, dans le domaine bancaire, euh, bancaire en ce moment, mais là en Europe, ça, ça, vraiment, ça démarre. Donc très content d'être là, merci de, de, de gérer la soirée. Je sais qu'il y, y a Safe qui nous, euh, qui, qui nous rejoint, qui est un expert euh, connu et reconnu. Donc quand il a été proposé de, de venir, bah, on a dit euh, oui tout de suite. Euh, on a aussi Yorick de Mombin qui est présent, qui est un magistrat de la Cour des Comptes. Et il est là à titre personnel, puisque ça fait aussi partie de notre, euh, notre objectif, c'est que l'écosystème se retrouve. On ne représente pas forcément notre entreprise, on est juste là aussi parce qu'on a envie d'apprendre, on a envie de partager. Et, euh, et dans ton cas, c'est d'envie de, bah, d'animer euh, des débats, des conversations. C'est votre euh, conférence, c'est votre meeting. Si on n'est pas là, euh, même si Save va parler de, de son livre hein, et de sa vision, mais c'est vraiment que vous, pour que vous puissiez échanger, poser des questions. Euh, voilà, c'est à double sens. Donc euh, un, un très grand merci d'être là. À la fois, il y a des étudiants, il y a des clients, il y a des gens d'Accenture, donc euh, euh, des gens d'institutions, de formation. Donc euh, on est très heureux de, de vous avoir tous là euh, ce soir. Voilà, donc sans plus attendre, je te passe le, le micro immédiatement pour gérer le débat. Merci. Merci. Bonsoir, on est tous très impatients d'entendre Saifedine, donc je vais juste dire deux mots rapides. Le premier pour le présenter et puis le deuxième pour parler un peu de son livre. Donc Saifedine Amous est professeur à la Lebanese American University et membre du Center on Capitalism and Society à Columbia, et euh, il vient de publier euh, son premier livre, The Bitcoin Standard, 
Et euh, en fait, c'est difficile d'imaginer comment il va pouvoir écrire un deuxième livre aussi bon que le premier. J'ai lu ce livre de Bitcoin Standard, je voulais en faire une revue de lecture et en fait, j'ai été totalement submergé par la richesse de ce livre. Il sera euh, à votre disposition euh, ce, après la, la conférence. Euh, C'est un livre absolument étonnant euh, parce qu'il ne parle pas que de Bitcoin. Il revient sur ce qu'est la monnaie, quelle est son importance dans les sociétés et les économies contemporaines. D'où vient la monnaie Quelle est l'histoire de la monnaie Quelle est l'essence de la monnaie Et comment cet objet s'est transformé à travers les âges pour arriver à une situation totalement absurde qui est la période contemporaine Et comment Bitcoin est une rupture majeure qui interrompt en fait l'évolution des dernières décennies Il parle aussi de la blockchain, évidemment. Et ce qu'il pourra nous dire ce soir sera un simple résumé très très court en fait, de, de la richesse de son livre que je ne saurais trop vous inciter euh, à lire. Et sur ce, je vous demande donc d'accueillir Saifuddin qui va nous parler de tout ça. Saifuddin, the, the floor is yours. Thank you everybody uh, for attending today. Thank you so much, Yurik, for the presentation and Alexander and uh, to everybody at Accenture. It's a real honor and a pleasure uh, to be here and speaking in front of you. Um, I'm going to today, um, I'm not going to explain how Bitcoin works. If this is what you're here for, unfortunately, you're in the wrong room. I will not be able to explain how Bitcoin works in uh, two hours. And you know, if you think and someone tells you he'll explain it in two hours, I don't think he knows how it works. So um, I'm going to assume that Bitcoin works and you know, it, is a, it works just like it does work. We're just going to focus on the economics. So what I want to discuss are a few of the main economic ideas in my book about the economics of Bitcoin, how Bitcoin operates, why it succeeds, why it has continued to operate safely, and what are the implications of this and how the world might change if Bitcoin continues to change or if Bitcoin continues to operate. So for me, the most important uh, characteristic about Bitcoin is the fact that it is hard money. And I use this term repeatedly in the book. In fact, it's not just hard money. In my opinion, Bitcoin is the hardest money ever invented. And that's why it's kind of a big deal, because it's not just, um, it's not just a form of money. The fact that it is the hardest money mean uh, carries significant implications for everybody because money is a competitive market at all times and all monies are always competing with each other and if history is any guide the harder money always wins so this is why it's worth paying attention to bitcoin because it is harder money than everything else that we have so specifically what is it about bitcoin that makes it such hard money um the the key difference between Bitcoin and all the other forms of money that we have rests on one technology that Satoshi Nakamoto added to, uh, to Bitcoin, which is what made it work. So if you study the history of how Bitcoin came about, if you study the history of the technologies that are utilized in it, things like the proof of work, hashing, cryptography, and all of that stuff, it has been around for many years and many decades. And there were many attempts to try and make digital cash and to create a form of digital cash. Bitcoin was the only one that worked and the first one to work because it introduced one important thing and that is the difficulty adjustment. This for me is the most important thing about Bitcoin. It's the reason, it's, it's, the, it's the glue that holds all of the um, parts of the system together. Without it, it would not function. And because of it, not only does it make Bitcoin functional, but it also makes Bitcoin arguably the most advanced form of money that we've ever invented. And the reason for that is it makes Bitcoin fundamentally different from everything else. With any other form of money, if everybody decides tomorrow in France that they want to use copper as money, hypothetically speaking, um, everybody sells all of the forms of money that they have and instead everybody buys copper. What's going to happen to the price of copper? What do you think? It goes up, right? But of course, it's very easy for copper miners to make more copper. So what do they do? They produce more copper and that floods the market with copper. And as long as you are storing copper in your backyard just to use it as money, they can keep providing more and more copper and eventually that will bring the price of copper down again. So anything that wants to become money 
faces that problem, what I call the easy money trap in the book. If it's easy for others to make it, they will make it if you use it as money. And then if the value goes up because you're using it as a store of value, there will be a supply response, which increases the supply, and brings the price down, and makes it not useful as a form of money. Historically, the most successful form of money all around the world was gold, precisely because it was the most resistant to this cycle. Because gold is so rare in Earth, and because it's very expensive to find and dig up, it's very hard for gold miners to flood the market with new supply, like with copper. And I show statistics on this. Um, the supply of gold every year increases by about 1.5%. That's it. It's very hard to increase it beyond that, because it's very hard to find more gold. And also because since gold's supply is, uh, since gold doesn't rust or corrode, it just keeps adding up. So the supply over time continues to add up. So we never lose any of the gold. And so new production is always a tiny fraction compared to the existing stockpile of thousands of years. That's not true in the case of copper or in any other metal because in the, the, the copper that we produced 100 years ago is all gone. So new production is only added onto existing stockpiles that are relatively small compared to new production. So it's very easy for everything else to be flooded if people use it as money. But in the long run, the only thing that wins the competition between monies is gold because it's hard for people to make more of it. And so it always grows at around 1% to 2% per year. So with the difficulty adjustment, what happens is that Bitcoin's growth rate is completely independent of people's demand for it. If more people use Bitcoin, unlike copper and gold and everything else, and government money, it is impossible for anybody to make more of it, right? If more people want money in a modern economy, the central bank will react by printing more money or lowering interest rates or whatever. But effectively, it's very possible, it, it's, it's highly likely that the central bank will respond to increased demand for money by increasing the supply. They will, you will see the same happen with copper, with everything else. But because of difficulty adjustment, Bitcoin doesn't have this. Instead, in, instead of the supply reacting to the increased demand in terms of the mining producing more Bitcoin, what happens in the case of Bitcoin is that the mining becomes more difficult. That's what the difficulty adjustment does. Every two weeks, the mining difficulty is revised. And so the quantity that is produced of the coins remains fixed. And what changes is the difficulty or the cost of mining it. Okay, So the schedule for producing Bitcoin is currently growing uh, at around 4% per year. It used to be very fast initially. The growth rate was very fast. Over time, the growth rate has dropped and it's continuing to drop. Now it's at around 4%. In, a, in about four years, it'll drop below the, um, or about six years, it'll drop below the value of uh, gold's growth, around 1.5%. So in five, six years, it'll be gr growing at a lower supply uh, growth rate than gold. And so, effectively, we're going to have a harder money than gold, a money that is harder to produce as gold. So what, is, what are the implications of this? The implications of this is that with any other money, as I said, if people use it as money, demand increases, price rises, supply responds with the increased supply, and that brings the price down. But in the case of Bitcoin, if demand increases because people are using Bitcoin as money, the price of Bitcoin increases, and then miners start mining more, but they can't make more Bitcoin than is already scheduled. Instead, they need to spend more money on processing power in order to make the network secure, in order to mine. And so the hash rate or the, uh, of the network rises. The amount of computing power and electricity used by the network rises, which effectively makes the network safer. Now, this is the tricky part. Because increased demand makes the difficulty rise, it makes the network safer. But with everything else, as we saw, it increases the supply, bringing the price down. But in the case of Bitcoin, as the network becomes safer, what happens uh, to the demand for it and to the value of it? It increases. So whereas with every other money, we have a negative feedback loop, that, that the, the easy money trap, that more demand for the money causes the supply to respond and bring the price down. In the case of Bitcoin, more demand for the money causes the security of the money to increase, which generates more demand, which causes more price rises, which causes more difficulty, 
higher security, and in turn, more demand, and so on. So effectively, in Bitcoin, we have a cycle that is self-reinforcing. Once the, once the Bitcoin design was put out in the open, this has just been continuing to grow over the last nine years. The uh, demand grows, you know, it was only two people using it, now it's tens of millions of people. The number of people using it grows, the price grows, the hash rate grows, it gets more secure, the value of transactions that are transacted continues to rise, the cost of attacking the network continues to rise, and as a result it becomes more secure. This is the black hole that is Bitcoin, that is eating up the entire world as we go. And this is essentially the dynamic that is causing Bitcoin to continue to grow unstoppably because there's no negative feedback. There's no central bank to flood the supply and um, reduce the rise in the price. The supply is completely fixed and so the price is just continuously rising as a result of it, making it even more attractive. In the long run, I think if we, uh, and in my book I talk a lot about these examples, if you look at what happens in history when a hard money is present in the same place and uh, with an easy money, it's very uh, predictable. The wealth of the people that is in easy money is going to effectively disappear. It's very hard for people to maintain wealth if they're storing it in easy money because others will just produce more of it. Whereas the people storing their wealth in hard money will end up gaining more and more wealth over time. So there's an example from um, um, West Africa, which is that they used to use uh, glass beads as money because they weren't commonly produced in Africa. So they were very rare and it was very hard to produce them. And so they served as a good unit of uh, money. But when Europeans came to West Africa, they saw that this was the money that Africans used to use. So they would get um, glass beads from Europe and go to Africa and use it to buy things in Africa. And eventually that is how Europeans managed to, to expropriate a lot of the wealth of Africans because they were able to print their money, which was very easy for Europeans to make, whereas it was very hard for Africans to make the money that Europeans had. And we see several examples of this repeating over time. And this is, I think, why Bitcoin is relevant, because it's, you know, it was not an option for people in West Africa to say, we do not care about gold as money and we are happy to keep using our glass beads as money. It's not possible to isolate yourself from other people using a money harder than yours because all that will happen is that you're just allowing them to expropriate your wealth easily simply by having the harder money that maintains its value. So this is really why I think Bitcoin is, um, is very important and worth paying attention to. And the, the implication of this, the implication of the hardness of Bitcoin, the implication of the fact that Bitcoin is very hard to make is that it, it's, it's also given us the first truly scarce liquid um, good that we have, the first truly scarce thing that could serve the function of money that we have developed. Because if you think about any other material or metal or resource that we have in, on Earth, yes, we think of them as being scarce and obviously you know, the Earth is a physically limited space um, and it has a certain fixed amount of oil or gold or copper or whatever. So it is, in, it is practically, it is technically scarce. All of these resources are scarce. However, in, the, in real terms, what determines how much we have of any other resource, of any resource in the world, is not how much of it exists on Earth, it's how much time we dedicate to it as opposed to other things, because the only scarce thing that we have is our time. In other words, you know, if, if people tomorrow decide that they like nickel, for instance, so much more than they already do, we find a new technology that needs a lot of nickel and it's very valuable and people are willing to pay a very high price for it. It's quite possible to increase nickel production very um, significantly, but it will come at a significant cost of uh, giving up on the production of many other things. So in other words, for pretty much any for every resource, every natural resource that exists on Earth, the limit on how much we produce of it is not how much of it exists on Earth, it is how much time we dedicate to it as opposed to other things. Because, you know, the Earth, even though it is finite, the Earth's diameter is about 12,000 kilometers. The biggest hole that anybody has ever dug to mine anything is about three th kilometers. So we've literally just scratched the surface of the Earth. If we have more time and more resources to keep digging, we could keep finding more. But what limits how much we make of everything is just 
the time that we dedicate to it as opposed to other things. The one exception to this, because of difficulty adjustment, is Bitcoin. Bitcoin it, oh, doesn't care. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins, and that's it. Doesn't matter how much time, money, and effort goes into producing more Bitcoins, the supply is always going to be fixed. So this, for me, is really a significant milestone for us as a human race because, effectively, we've managed to create one thing that is liquid, that we could use for payment, that is dividable and combinable, that uh, you could move around, send all over the world, and yet it's strictly scarce. The supply is strictly fixed. The only other thing that we have that is strictly fixed and scarce is our time on Earth. That's the only thing that is really scarce. And so, if you think of it, the search for money is a search for a store of value that is produced across, uh, for a store of value across time. So I work today, I earn money today, I'd like a way for me to keep that value into the future, and so I put that, mon uh, that value into a form of money. But any money that can be produced at an extra, uh, whose supply can be increased, you can think of that as an inefficiency in the form of money. You can think of that as like an inefficiency in an engine. The more people are able to make of the money that you use, the more they are expropriating the wealth that you stored in that money without them having to actually work and produce value like you did. So you work, you store your value in Venezuelan bolivars, but then the Venezuelan government increases the supply of bolivars and then all of the value that you had in it is gone. This is true for pretty much every single thing. Gold was the best answer to this because it was the hardest to make. But now Bitcoin completely eliminates this inefficiency because you know there will only ever be 21 million. So if you buy one Bitcoin today, you know that's one out of 21 million of all the Bitcoins that will ever exist forever. That's it. There will never be any way of making more Bitcoins than this. We can get into a discussion about why we know whether that's true or not. It's a little bit technical, but I'll uh, skip it for, the, for now. But the important thing is now, I think this makes Bitcoin arguably the best store of value ever invented. Because if you store your value in it, okay, there is oscillation and people might buy and sell and the value might change, but at least you know nobody can make more of it. From the supply side, there's no inefficiency in terms of somebody flooding the market and increasing the supply with it. This, I think, um, is going to carry significant implications for us because it's going to allow us to preserve our wealth further and further into the future. Now, what does it mean if people are able to have a store of value that is very reliable and likely to appreciate over time? This is effectively the topic of the three middle chapters of my book, chapters five, six, and seven, where I look at the differences between societies that run on easy money versus societies that run on hard money. And mo mostly I do this comparison between uh, countries on the gold standard in the 19th century versus today. And uh, the most important aspect of this uh, for me is time preference, the topic of chapter five which is how much people value the present compared to the future. So people who have a high time preference value the present much more than the future. They're unable to think too much about the future. People who have low time preference, on the other hand, focus a lot on the future. In my opinion, and I argue this in the book and I try and present a lot of evidence for it, the ability to have hard money encourages people to have a low time preference. The ability to have a, a reliable store of value is likely to make you think more about the future because you are able to save for the future. So people in Venezuela today, they get their paycheck, they go and they spend it immediately on the same day because they know that the next day is going to lose 20-30% of their value. Now, that's an extreme example obviously, but if you knew your money was losing 5% per year in terms of its value, in terms of its purchasing power, in about 15 years, it would lose half of its value, something like that. Um, on the other hand, if your money was appreciating by 5% per year, in 15 years, it would double in value. So think about if you lived in those two economies, in those two hypothetical alternate universes, where are you more likely to save? Obviously, in the economy where the money appreciates, right? Because it's worth it to keep $100 now, because in 15 years, there'll be 200. It's not really worth saving much if in 15 years you put 100 now and in 15 years it'll be worth about 50, right? So the tendency to save will increase, the tendency towards consumption will decline, 
In other words, time preference will drop. And for me, this is an enormously significant thing, and the economic impacts of it are enormously significant. People will uh, save more. That will lead to more capital accumulation. That will lead to more investment. That will lead to rising productivity and improving material standards. This is essentially the process of civilization. The process of civilization is the process of people dropping their time preference and moving away from immediate gratification, from trying to always gratify their immediate needs, towards um, future orientation, towards caring about the future. So the first step is you invest in capital goods rather than in consumption goods, and over time the capital accumulates and the productivity increases. This is really how civilization happens. And I think hard money, you know, it's, it's no coincidence that the height of civilization in the 19th century coincided with the gold standard. And I talk about this in depth in my book because, you know, we hear a lot about how the gold standard was bad, but really the example that is usually given is that there was the Great Depression under the gold standard, but the Great Depression came about precisely because the gold standard was abandoned. There were no recessions in the periods in which the gold standard was adhered to. And there was continuous economic growth, high saving rates, and economic activity continued to increase and productivity continued to increase. In fact, if you look, about the, if you look at the sort of inventions that came about in the 19th century, we like to think of technology as always advancing, but really, compared to Compare the things that are being invented now to the things that were invented in the 19th century, and I think the 19th century comes out ahead. You know, we've been um, adding bells and whistles to the stuff that we invented in the 19th century mainly. You know, all of the things that we like, let's face it, it's just a telegraph with bells and whistles. That's your internet. The telegraph was made in the 19th century. The car, the airplane, central heating, uh, sewage, pretty much all of the things that make modern life possible were invented then, and in the 20th century they spread out. Perhaps there is something there. And, you know, if you look at art under eras of hard money, you see artists who worked for years on developing their craft and skill and who produced work that took years to finish. Compared to today, you see artists who spend a few minutes working on their project and then tell a story about how it's, um, you know, special because it, you know, makes a statement or something or the other. But really it's just hiding the fact that Nobody today spends years working on a masterpiece like they did a few, a few hundred years ago. Our music is, what, two, three minutes long today? We don't have any Beethovens, we don't have any Mozarts anymore composing all these things that they used to uh, compose. And I think this is fundamentally related to time preference. And I'm willing to say that I think if we move towards a standard of hard money, time preference would go back to dropping and I think we would see the, the return to those things that we associate with backwardness and we think of as being in the past, I think we could get back to them and I think um, these sorts of changes would happen. And I think this might be the most important uh, impact of moving towards a hard money. Secondary impact I think is that it would limit the ability of government to finance itself because it no longer can inflate the money supply whenever it needs to finance itself. And thirdly, and this is where it gets into a business cycle theory. I think, um, you know, this is going to sound crazy, but for Austrian school economists, the only reason that we, you get inflation or recessions, the only th reason that you get business cycles is because of easy money, particularly because of central bank manipulation of the interest rate. So, whereas for most economists, you know, we need the central bank to fight the business cycle, to fight the recession, to fight inflation, for the Austrian school economist, this is exactly like an uh, arsonist pretending to be a fireman. He always happens to be the first next to the fire, and he's always telling you he's fighting the fire, but, you know, maybe he was the one who started it. And so, um, you know, uh, we can get into this in more detail in the discussion. I don't want to keep the speech going for long, but one interesting piece of data that I found as evidence for this is Switzerland, which was the last country to abandon the gold standard, effectively was on the gold standard until the 1970s. And if you look at Swiss unemployment rate up until the 1970s, it never went above 1%. It, it rarely ever went above 0.5%. Then from the 1970s until the 90s, when they were kind of on the gold standard, the unemployment rate would go up to 1 or 2%. And then in 1992, I think it was, when Switzerland sold half of its gold and effectively the Swiss franc became just like any other currency, when in the 70s it was just gold, roughly. Since then, Swiss unemployment has just uh, rocketed up to 5%, 3%, 4% all the time. 
And, you know, it's the same country, the same people. The only things that have changed are the monetary system. Under hard money, there was no recession. Under easy money, now they get all these recessions. I don't think it's a coincidence. And, you know, if you study Austrian business cycle theory, you'll see why that is the case. You'll see why the 20th century, the century in which supposedly we invented central banks to stop business cycles and to stop recessions, was the century that had the most business cycles and the most recessions. Um, so we can, we can get into all of these in more detail uh, during the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saifedin. Uh, I will ask the first question and then um, everyone will be able to, to ask some questions. Um, I, I, I would like to ask a question about volatility of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a um, very serious matter. Everybody is very impressed by the huge volatility of Bitcoin. In your book, you have a few pages about that. Uh, I would like you to uh, elaborate a little uh, on that. Mm -hmm. you, you say that the, the volatility of Bitcoin is normal it's structural, it's due to the fact that the supply is fixed, of course, and there is no, um, um, uh, there, there is no uh, policy uh, to, to change the, the supply. And uh, so if the supply is fixed, of course, uh, the, when there is some variation of the demand, it's normal that uh, there is a lot of volatility of, the, um, of the, the, the price. But you said that the volatility is going to decrease with time uh, if more people use Bitcoin, if more financial instruments are built, uh, and if more people hold Bitcoin. Uh, and you say that once uh, Bitcoin has stopped developing, if enough people have uh, started to use it, uh, then it will attract less speculators and then the volatility will decrease. But my, my question is, what metrics would you use to describe this situation? When, this, when, when can this occur? Uh, can it be in one year, in two years, in 10 years, in 50 years? Um, how do you consider that at a certain level, enough people have uh, started to use Bitcoin? And how do you take into account the, the influence, the current one and the future one, of the whales, the, the actors of the market who have a huge influence on the market because they hold a large proportion of Bitcoins? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, first of all, I mean, as an Austrian school economist, I don't believe that we can make uh, predictions according to timelines. So. I don't think you know anybody who tells you it'll take one year or five years uh, is just trying to make a prediction because they want to make a prediction, not because they have anything to support it. Fundamentally, what drives Bitcoin's price and Bitcoin's volatility is just people buying it. And that's the sum outcome of seven and a half billion brains around the world, each individually waking up every morning and deciding either to buy, sell, or not buy or not sell Bitcoin, you know? The every morning somebody wakes up and makes those choices about whether they want to um, buy or sell. And of course it's impossible to predict what seven and a half million, billion people are all going to do. So I don't really know how fast it will take if this, or uh, um, uh, you know, how long it'll take. But I think we can identify the pattern as I used to make, say we, we can ha make pattern predictions of how this is likely to evolve. And the way that I see it is currently Bitcoin is not money yet in the sense of it being used as the medium of exchange. It's not the common medium of exchange that people use. I've rarely ever used Bitcoin myself. I've hardly ever spent it. Um, it's not something that people are using yet to spend. It's a, it's a good that is being monetized. And so you can think of this stage of monetization as the growth of Bitcoin, as, as the starting phase. And you know, it could take another 10, 20, 30 years. But at this stage, you can think of buying Bitcoin as being more like an investment on uh, more like a bet on the network growing, more like a bet on the idea that this thing is going to grow as an alternative to central banking. And that's the title of my book. It, Bitcoin is a decentralized alternative to central banking. You know, if you want to think about sending money abroad, your only option is your central bank or Bitcoin. Now we only finally have an alternative to the central bank, which is Bitcoin. So buying Bitcoin right now is like betting on this um, alternative to continue to grow. 
This is more of a speculative bet. It's an entrepreneurial bet. It's a market bet, and it's a prediction that people who are buying Bitcoin today are making about how others will buy in the future. Now, as long as Bitcoin is uh, currently, Bitcoin is about 0.1 or 0.2 percent of the entire money supply of the world, which is nothing. So that means that you know, if you have one rich person today deciding that they want to buy Bitcoin, they could move the market significantly. Or one rich person deciding to sell Bitcoin can also move the market significantly, because you know the the, the amount of wealth in in Bitcoin is very tiny. So if somebody with half a billion dollar wants to buy Bitcoin today, they will cause a massive change in the price. So if we move to a world in which Bitcoin is say 40, 50, 60 percent of the value of the entire money supply, at that point, any particular person buying or selling will become less significant. Now, in turn, as this growth reaches, as, as Bitcoin reaches a point where it's already grown so much, you know, if it's already at 60% of the value of the money supply, that means it can't grow more than another 60% extra until it eats all of the money in the world. And so, you know, the, the, or if it gets to 80% of the money supply, then it's not going to grow more than another 10, 20, 30%. So therefore, the possibility for it then to be a speculative bet declines. At that point, it becomes more, if anybody wants to buy Bitcoin, they're not buying it thinking that it's going to triple next year or that it's going to go up five-fold next year. They're buying it as a reliable store of value. It'll become like gold. You buy it not because it's going to make you rich. You buy it because you can be sure relatively that it won't lose its value significantly like other things usually do. So once we've reached that sort of point, then I think you know, the demand for Bitcoin as a speculative asset will decline, and the demand for Bitcoin as a sort of store of value, which is much less volatile, and will likely have far fewer large value transactions. So you know, very few people decide to go in and out of cash very significantly. And so you could see that becoming the case over time. And that, I think, would lead to a reduction in the volatility, which would then um, allow it to become more and more used as a medium of exchange. But at this point, it doesn't make a lot of sense to use it as a medium of exchange, and the majority of Bitcoiners don't. You pay your... Yeah, effectively, as long as people are willing to accept another form of money, the cheap, easy money, there's no reason for me as a Bitcoiner to part with my Bitcoins. Uh, but the reality is, I don't expect this excellent offer to always be there. Currently, I'm lucky enough that people will accept whatever euros and dollars I carry in my pocket. But, you know, eventually I expect them to wise up that they're the ones getting the bad end of the deal by getting those things. And eventually I think it'll become much harder for you to spend these kinds of money. And so more and more people will tend towards the harder money. When that happens, I think we could see a reduction in the volatility. Thank you. Do we have uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, uh, Two-part two question. Uh, first, about uh, maximalism. Um, how do you see Bitcoin forks and altcoin? Do you see them as distract destruction or maybe interesting experiment or attacks? And second part is about minimalism, uh, meaning that you, maybe do you prefer Bitcoin to be just money and not even programmable money? Not uh, do you don't like Segwit or you think it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, something negative or no? Uh, Merkleizer abstract uh, syntax, syntax tree, no mm. Schnorr signature, no second layer like uh, Woodstock. Uh, so maximalism and minimalism, okay. please. Um, in terms of altcoins and forks, I think um, I don't think they're competition for Bitcoin. I mean, be, uh, that's the key thing. I think Bitcoin's competition is the dollar, the euro, the Swiss franc, the yen, the British pound, the IMF, SDR, and gold. Those are the only things that you can use to send money across the world. If you wanted to send money to China today, these are your options, okay? And Bitcoin. The other coins, in my opinion, do not constitute that because um, the main reason fundamentally is that all of these coins are effectively centrally controlled. And you know, the just simply copying Bitcoin's design 
does not recreate the economic incentives that made Bitcoin what it is today. The reason Bitcoin is what it is today is because the economic design was the first one out there. And the person who made it disappeared so that it didn't grow because he was the one promoting it. It's not his baby, effectively. He didn't foster it. He didn't spend any marketing money on it. The marketing budget for Bitcoin is still zero. Nobody has ever been able to spend money on it, on marketing it. So how did it grow? You know, the, when it grew, unlike today's altcoins, there were no glowing press releases uh, pretending to be um, investigative journalism about how, you know, this altcoin will change everything and blah, 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 and all of this fancy buzzwords. Bitcoin didn't have that. It just grew because people on the internet used it and it provided economic incentives for people to use it. And the result of this and we, is that we can really say that nobody controls Bitcoin. And, you know, you could say this and make the claim um, up until 2017, and it would have been hard to convince people. But in 2017, we really saw exactly why Bitcoin is not controlled by anybody. Because about 90% of the hash rate, I mean, the, the, what secures the network is the hash rate. About 90%, of the owners of 90% of the, of the hash rate, plus the operators of the, plus the owners of the majority of the startups in Bitcoin, plus the most famous names of people who are associated with Bitcoin, yeah, they all wanted to go and produce a new coin uh, to change Bitcoin. They only wanted to change just the um, extra, the, just the uh, block size, which is a tiny little technical parameter. You know, we're not even talking about changing the money supply. They just tried to change that and they failed miserably. And one group ended up, you know, they ended up with some canceled the project and then another bunch of people made another coin and we ended up with Bitcoin Cash. But the problem is, you know, of course, Bitcoin continues completely unaffected. In fact, after the fork, Bitcoin probably um, grew because we got rid of all the elements of the people who were trying to fork Bitcoin, and so we got rid of the uncertainty. But for me, Bitcoin Cash and all the forks are effectively dead on arrival because, and you know, I hope nobody gets offended by me using this term, but effectively, Bitcoin is the only one that has the immaculate conception that allows it to be neutral money. Bitcoin's conception is immaculate in the sense that nobody controls it. But all the other altcoins, there are thousands of them out there. If you have heard of any altcoin, and I, you know we could pass a piece of paper around and ask everybody to list every altcoin they've ever heard of, and then collate the list of all the altcoins and see them. If anybody in this room has heard of an altcoin, it is because somebody is marketing it actively. Somebody's promoting it. There is a foundation behind it. There is a group of people who have worked hard and put themselves in Forbes magazine and all sorts of places to market it. And those people can change it, as we saw with the second biggest coin, which is Ethereum. It was very trivial for them to hard fork it, and they're always hard forking, and every other coin can hard fork trivially. Bitcoin is the only one that resists hard forking. So for, a, for any altcoin to claim to be a competition to Bitcoin, it needs to show that nobody controls it. Why does nobody controlling it matter so much in my opinion? Because it's the only way that we are guaranteed that the monetary policy is immutable. So to go back to the point of uh, the hardness of the money, you know, it's not just because Bitcoin's programmed that way, it's because it's programmed that way and the key that edits the program has been thrown into the ocean and now nobody can edit it. We can be very certain that Bitcoin is not going to change its monetary policy. But with all the other coins, just because it's written in code and we call it a blockchain doesn't mean it's set in stone. It can be changed. Uh, Ethereum doesn't even know what their monetary policy is and they're going to decide as a community about it. And you know, if you would like to have a committee and speaking in name of a community deciding the monetary policy, we already have central banks and they do a decent job of it. You don't need a bunch of programmers who have never studied economics to be handling that. So I don't think they're, uh, they are in a sense an attack, maybe not, but I wouldn't say an attack on Bitcoin. They're an attack on Bitcoiners in the sense of it's, uh, you know, altcoins are a great way of separating Bitcoin from Bitcoiners because in the long run, altcoins are easy money because their supply can be increased, but also, in the aggregate, this notion of cryptographic money, which is still centrally controlled by a foundation or group of people, is, um, you know, it's, it's not scarce in any way. We have thousands of coins, we can make many thousands, and there's nothing that differentiates any of them from the other. You know, adding all these bells and whistles doesn't make any of them special. They can all um, uh, add the buzzwords and buy marketing and um, do that. Um, in terms of the minimalism, 
I would also say yes. I'm, uh, if, if Bitcoin does absolutely nothing but simple transactions, and if SegWit was impossible to implement, and if all of these amazing innovations that uh, people are working on were simply doomed to never be implemented, and we were stuck with Bitcoin as it was, let's say, three years ago, with just about you know, half a million ca transaction capacity, that's good enough for me. Okay, so I'm, I'm yes. I'm not saying it's worse that uh, those things get implemented. I think, I think Bitcoin is fine as it is with just carrying out half a million transactions a day. I think that on its own could be the basis of a global financial system wherein these half a million transactions a day are just the final settlement transactions between banks around the world and then individual consumer payments happen on second and third layers. Just like they do in the current system, you know, um, you know your payment on a credit card is settled at the end of the day between central banks or between banks with, with settlement payments. So I think Bitcoin is already good enough and it was good enough without any of these additions. However, as long as an addition can be added and integrated with a soft fork, without a hard fork, then it's fine by me. And all the additions that do not require other members of the network to make a change in order for them to stay along with you in the same network, these are changes that are fine. So fundamentally, you know, no, um, the reason you can't oppose SegWit is that even if you don't like it and if you think it's bad, you're not forced to use it, right? That's, that's the beauty of a soft fork. You can just continue to use Bitcoin without SegWit, without running it on your node, and many people still do. So um, any innovation that comes in the form of soft fork for me is good. Um, maybe I might not want to use it myself, but I'm glad to see others use it. But the important thing is uh, that it doesn't affect the monetary policy. It's not a hard work. Thank you. I've got a question for you, uh, Saifdin. Mm -hmm. um, so we all know how works um, the block reward. Um, we know that when a, a miner validates a block, he get reward. Uh, so uh, there's some Bitcoins created out of thinner. It's in uh, the Bitcoin protocol rules. And also there's the transaction fees. Mm -hmm. um, in a few future, miners won't be available to uh, get the reward from the blocks. Mm -hmm. um, um, do you mind that uh, Bitcoin security will still uh, as high as it is right now? That's a very good question, and it's not one that I can answer definitively. Uh, it, it might, the, there is a scenario in which the uh, lack of a the new inflation reduces the security because it reduces the reward. But I think it's highly unlikely because if we continue to, um, you know, I mean, if, if the network continues to grow, if the coins become more valuable, then the transaction, the, the, the transaction fees themselves are likely going to be enough to incentivize miners to continue to secure the network. And, um, you know, obviously, it's hard to say this as a prediction, but we did get a little bit of a taste of it in uh, December last year when there was a lot of attacks on the network and we had uh, transaction fees rose to a point where f on some blocks, the majority of the reward was in the form of transaction fees rather than as uh, the mining subsidy. So we saw that it continued to operate like that and we saw that miners, uh, you know, the network was still secure, the hash rate continued to grow. And I'm, I'm inclined to think that would be the case. So in two years, in exactly two years, I think two years and a day from now, Bitcoin's uh, new supply will drop by half. And so we'll have each block will come with 6.7 uh, new Bitcoins rather than the 12.5 that we get right now. So most likely the, uh, you know, the, the, the percentage of uh, the reward that miners make will be made up higher, uh, a higher percentage of it will be coming from fees. And um, yeah, th we don't have any solid evidence with which to make this prediction, but all the, ele all the evidence shows that it shouldn't be a problem. As long as people want to use Bitcoin, they will pay transaction fees, and the transaction fees should be enough to secure the network. If people don't want to use Bitcoin, people don't want to pay transaction fees, people don't want to hold it, then the price drops and the security will drop. But, um, there's no reason to really believe that, uh, in my opinion, that you know, simply shifting towards transaction fees will cause the security to, to decline.
I've got a, a, a last question um, compared to, uh, we, we talk about uh, soft fork, mm -hmm. and so there's the uh, uh, upcoming uh, lightning uh, uh, development uh, just right now mm -hmm. happening. Um, I, I wanted to, to know uh, what's your stance compared to, uh, should we had a transaction fees uh, with a lightning transaction, or should we uh, keep it free? How do you on forecast? lightning transactions? You mean? Yeah, yeah. It was a uh, 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 a trending topic uh, during the last uh, scaling Bitcoin. Should we have phase two lightning uh, transaction? What what your stand on that? I mean, I think it's a decision for lightning node operators to decide. Effectively, what lightning is going to build is, I in my opinion, a, a more advanced form of programmable bank. It's uh, it's just a far more efficient way of doing banking. In other words, I think uh, you you posted a great tweet about this, Yurik, that it's uh, you know you you take your money to the bank and they give you a card and then you use that card to spend. Similarly, you send your bitcoins to the Lightning node, and they put them there, and then you can spend and receive money onto the node. And then whenever you want to settle it or close it or take it out, you can close the channel. So I think this is going to be a market good that um, you know we'll find different models for pricing it. Um, perhaps people will make it free, but you know combine it with some form of advertisement. Perhaps people will pay for it. Um, perhaps there will be lightning nodes that provide, say, um, complete secrecy and anonymity, and people will pay a premium for that. Other nodes might benefit from the model of selling your data, which everybody uses today, and people might be happy for it. My expectation would be that there would be, I mean, if I were to take a guess, I would just say very, very low small fees would be the most common model. Um, if if uh, those fees uh, could um, affect uh, the Bitcoin security, uh, if, if miners are uh, less motivated to uh, mine blocks? No, because remember, you know, the, 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 the Lightning transaction is never as secure as a Bitcoin transaction. And the Lightning developers will say this. They are the first to always say this. You know, you should not use Lightning transactions for very high value transactions. So um, I can't see this competing to it because the only way that we will get Lightning transactions is if on-chain transactions grow in value and in the transaction fees so much that it incentivizes building the second layer, which will always be inferior to the first layer. So we'll always have the first layer transaction, the mining rewards and uh, the transaction fees going to miners. And then Lightning will come as a second layer. So I don't think it would compete with it. And on the contrary, you know, think about it as I if the Bitcoin blockchain, as I argue in my book, will become more of a settlement network between banks, then you would expect the transaction costs to grow up, to grow very fast. In fact, I mean, the way that I see it is Bitcoin is the most secure way of sending value around the world, the most secure, most efficient way. You know, if you wanted to send a billion dollars, I bet you to find an easier, more secure way than sending them with Bitcoin right now. So in my mind, the, if Bitcoin, let's assume it's, it's, um, it's stuck at half a million transactions where it is now, in my mind, being the most secure way of sending transactions means that this will eventually end up those half a million transactions will end up being the half a million most important, most valuable transactions in the world. So, because it's the most secure way of doing them. So eventually, the most important transactions of settlement between banks will be on, on chain and then consumer and individual payments will come on second layers. I think this is a very important thing that we're beginning to see with Bitcoin over the last year or two. Bitcoin's not going to scale in terms of having more on-chain transactions because that would be very bad engineering. Bitcoin will scale on second layer transactions and on first la and through first layer transactions rising in value, not in number. Yes. So, um, assuming uh, the strengthening of the security doesn't send uh, the price uh, to ex excessive highs, so assuming that the, the price of, uh, of Bitcoin uh, plateaus with the security being at a level that's acceptable for everyone, um, how do you actually see the current monetary system and the current wealth distribution as it is today accept to actually transfer to Bitcoin because it's another monetary system with another wealth distribution? Yeah. So how do you see big wealth uh, from the fiat currencies accepting to, to go in a system where 
big wealth in the Bitcoin system is already installed. It's the people who took the biggest bets yeah. and who mined the earliest in the story of the... Okay, so first of all, I, I disagree with the premise. I don't think that it would be possible for Bitcoin's price and hash rate to stabilize um, because there's no such a thing as secure good enough, good enough security because security is an, is, is, is an arms race. So as processing power gets cheaper, attacking Bitcoin gets cheaper. So Bitcoin needs to always become stronger so that it's always ahead, right? So, um, so the way that I see it, it has to keep growing and the uh, processing power will keep growing, which means the value will keep growing, which to answer your second question is how everybody will have to come along. The way that I see it, honestly, is that it's not optional. I mean, you will either move there or you will watch your wealth lose its value as the people who put their money there appreciate you know i mean just think about it you know if you have a million dollars and you put them in a currency that's constantly depreciating where somebody has ten thousand dollars and puts them in a currency that's constantly appreciating it's only a matter of time until they overtake you and you know people are not stupid they will realize this and they will want to move forward so the when i talk when when i talk about bitcoin adoption People think of it as being like, say, um, Apple iPhone adoption. You know, it's very nice and very cute, and then people will buy it. But I think that's not the model for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is more like gunpowder adoption. You know, if you think about it, w did the French army have a choice whether they should adopt gunpowder or not? You know, did they decide, no, you know what, we like to keep it real with sticks and stones and swords, and uh, and we're not going to use gunpowder. If you know any army that decided to do this. It didn't matter because then another army with gunpowder would come and take over France. So eventually everywhere in the world ended up with gunpowder, either because people adopted it or because it was used against them. And I think Bitcoin is like that. Bitcoin is like financial gunpowder. It's the safest way of sending money halfway around the world, the most secure way. And it's the hardest money that we've ever invented. So. It's not something that is, you know, whether we should or want to, or whether people, you know, we, we try to win people over. And this, you know, this is why my book is not marketing for Bitcoin, because I don't think marketing for Bitcoin matters. At the end of the day, this is economic reality. The harder money will, min, will win, you know. Gold beats silver, and I discussed this in my book, not because, um, uh, you know, there was better marketing for gold or there was better propaganda for gold. It beats silver because of economic reality. Gold grew at a much slower rate than silver. The value of silver declined. And I think this is, this is really the, the, the case with, um, with, with Bitcoin, I think, in the long run. Oh, but can I just add one small uh, point to this question? In terms of you know the the, the wealth distribution and people, uh, yeah, th there's obviously going to be a lot of bitterness towards uh, early Bitcoiners. You know, somebody bought a thousand dollars and now they're sitting on five million dollars, and yeah, of course it's not very nice if you weren't the one who bought those. But in the long run, you know, in in the long run, what Bitcoin is going to do is it's going to actually lead to a much more fair distribution of wealth for the very simple reason that will completely remove the ability of anybody to get wealthy through printing money, which is what governments do, which is what um, uh, you know the ability to inflate the money supply does. So in the long run, yeah, you might get rich now because you invested early in Bitcoin, but you know if you're going to exercise your richness, you're going to be spending those coins and then they'll eventually disappear. And of course, people will spend, you know, uh, uh, Bitcoiners like to joke about hodling to the grave and holding your coins and never selling them. But let's face it, I mean, if the coins that you own are worth 10 times the value of your mortgage, which you're paying off and having trouble paying, of course, you're going to sell, you know, you're going to fix your life, you're going to get married, you're going to have kids, you, you need to buy diapers, so you will sell your Bitcoins. So as the price rises, it incentivizes people to sell, and that rearranges the distribution. So it, over time, the only way to have a lot of wealth will be similar to the st days of the gold standard, which is to work hard, be productive, and earn money. That's what hard money is. Easy money incentivizes everybody in society not to work hard, but to get connected to the people who print the money. Because, you know, why work hard? And, you know, you look at the modern global economy today, you know, if you run a bank, your incentive is not to run the bank efficiently to please your customers. Your incentive is to run the bank to please the government and the Federal Reserve, who are the ones who essentially determine your survival and profitability. So if you eliminate that sort of economic incentive structure and replace it with hard money, 
Yeah, maybe you know the the, the people who got lucky early. Um, in the long run, eventually they're going to lose it. And what's going to determine whether you're going to be wealthy in the long run is going to be your productivity, number one, and number two, your time preference, your ability to save and hold on. So all of the Bitcoiners holding their Bitcoin waiting to buy the Lambo, you know, Lamborghinis are some of the fastest depreciating assets in the world. So this is how you don't worry too much about the um, early Bitcoin adopters. They're going to blow all of their money on Lamborghini. Anyways. <laughs> So I guess we got the first Bitcoin maximalist question. <laughs> Hi, thanks for coming to Paris. I'm Thank pleased you. to see you. Um, it, it seems that from this point of view of a central banker or government, the only thing that's separating Bitcoin from becoming their dream control mechanism would be the decentralization, which I'm sure you'd agree with. What would be your take on the future threat when they come out with their e-cash or whatever ver centralized version, which is likely to, which is in the works everywhere, apparently, yeah. what is your take on the threat or the menace to Bitcoin from regulation and taxation attacks? Um, generally, Thanks. I'm not very concerned about those things. I discussed them a little bit in detail in the book. I think, you know, the, the central banks continue to talk about we're going to make a central bank issued Bitcoin. And uh, they've been doing this for more than 100 years. This is what their coins are. This is what national currencies are. Um, you know, the, the, currently, the euro, the dollar, 80 or 90% of the supply is digital already. So when they talk about, you know, we're going to make something like Bitcoin, they think, I, I don't understand what they're meaning. And, and the only people who say this are the people who don't really understand how Bitcoin functions. Because if you're really going to make a currency like Bitcoin, what that means is that the Transaction clearance isn't determined by the central bank deciding, okay, this guy can send his money, that guy can send his money. It's simply cryptography. If you have the right private key, you can send and nobody can stop you. So if a central bank implements that, that's a central bank just basically putting itself out of a job. The other job that the central bank has is monetary policy. And if you're going to implement something like Bitcoin from a central bank with a programmable, algorithmically determined monetary policy, then, you know, that's the central bank putting its other half out of business. So if they control it, exactly, but if they control the money supply and if they control the payment clearance, then, but that's already what we have. That's exactly what we have right now. I mean, the only difference is that we have some physical bills around there, that's it. Which, you know, if they try to, and that's to answer your second question, if they try to move away from physical cash, if they try to tax Bitcoin, if they try to prevent people from buying Bitcoin, all that they're actually doing is advertising Bitcoin, advertising the use case for Bitcoin. Because if they make it impossible for you to spend $100 without them finding out and without everybody in the world having a record of what you're doing, and because all your payments have to go through, a, um, uh, have to go through the central bank and the credit card or whatever, then people are going to buy Bitcoin because people don't want everybody to know everything that they're spending their money on. And then, you know, if you, if, you know, if for instance, imagine a country goes and says, you can't buy Bitcoin with your bank account money. W initially, that will sound like it's bad for Bitcoin. But in the long run, what it does is that it enforces the point that that, what you think is your money in the bank is not really your money. If somebody can tell you this is your money, but you can't use it to buy one, two, three, four, then it's not really your money. And once people start realizing that, they're going to want to have a money that they control. And guess what? Bitcoin is that. So, you know, it's going to be impossible. I mean, think about the example of, say, Ecuador, uh, when they were going through inflation. They banned the U.S. dollar and they made it illegal for people to hold the U.S. dollar and they persecuted people for trading dollars and so on. And now, where is the Ecuadorian, whatever it was called? It's gone. And now everybody uses dollars in Ecuador. So economic reality of the hard and easy money you know, you can't just legislate it away. And in fact, I think the legislation would be counterproductive. In my book, I have a section where I talk about the ways of killing Bitcoin. And I talk about these ideas or technical attacks and, and, and my objection to them, why I don't think they can be effective is that they fly in the face of economic incentives. And anything that tries to go against economic incentives is doomed. You know, you look at the experience of Eastern Europe, you know, how many decades they spent trying to um, you know, ban genes, for instance, in, in, in Eastern European countries because genes is an evil capitalist uh, conspiracy. And now communism is gone and everybody in Poland wears genes. And that's it. You know, you, you're not going to be able to do this. 
In fact, I think the, if they wanted to stop Bitcoin, the only effective way would be the exact opposite. If we go back to a gold standard, and if you give people complete sovereignty over their money, and banks are able to give people complete freedom and um, anonymity if they want it, and banking security if they want it, if you had that system, that would be a real threat to Bitcoin. Then that kills the demand that people have for holding Bitcoin. That kills the real use cases. You know, why would you want to bet on some obscure technology that nobody really understands and nobody really knows how it works when we already have gold uh, with a 6,000 year head start? I think that really is the most serious threat to Bitcoin. No, on the contrary, I think the, all of the attacks are not threats to Bitcoin. They are just feeding the fire, basically, feeding that black hole that is uh, just eating the world of economic uh, value. We've got a, a question here from the audience. Yeah. Yes, I have a question regarding uh, altcoins. Um, mm -hmm. You are uh, close to uh, Austrian economics, mm -hmm. so you should uh, like uh, competition in currencies. Mm -hmm. Ayak like himself uh, thought that uh, competition in currencies uh, might end up in uh, several uh, established uh, currencies. And uh, for example, there was a uh, big metallism in Europe uh, at the end of uh, 19th centuries. Mm -hmm. And so I don't see why you dismiss the possibility that some altcoins could uh, be a real competition against uh, Bitcoin. Uh, for example, regarding the marketing and centralization argument, uh, Monero, for example, there are no marketing, there is no marketing for Monero, there is no foundation. And uh, we, we could uh, even argue that uh, the fungibility is better than uh, Bitcoin's one. So I think uh, why you, you are dis okay. so dismissive uh, regarding some icons. Okay. Well, first of all, with regards to Monero, I mean, Monero has a hard fork every, what, six months or three months or two months or whatever. I mean, there's a close group of people who practically can change Monero at will. In fact, the most recent hard fork really showed how how centralized and how not open source Monero is when the coders change the algorithm for the hashing without the, they try to change it to fool the miners because they don't want the miners to build ASICs. So effectively you have a close committee of people that decide how to change the algorithm all the time. And that's just one example of one altcoin. We can keep uh, finding different examples, but generally, you know, the reason they all fail in, technically, they all have glaring technical failures, is very simple. All the competent coders, all the competent developers, they are the sort of, you know, all the competent engineers, once they saw that the wheel was invented, they didn't go and try and invent a better square wheel or a triangular wheel or let's do this. They saw that the wheel was invented and they built on it. Let's build a car, let's build a, a cart, let's do things that based on the wheel. So if you look at the, at the altcoin space, with, I hope there aren't any altcoin devs here, but really all the competent developers are in Bitcoin. And all the technology that is used in altcoins was developed by Bitcoin developers. No single altcoin has contributed anything useful in terms of development. And, you know, for instance, Monero's confidential transactions were developed by Greg Maxwell. Why weren't they applied on Bitcoin? because they're unworkable on Bitcoin, they're too large. And still, even with Monero right now, the, the, the transactions are very large, the potential for Monero to scale is very problematic. Essentially, it's just you know taking the leftovers of Bitcoin developers and then running uh, coin on it and then listing it on exchanges and selling it. Monero doesn't have a foundation, but you know the marketing gimmick for Monero is that it is the rebel sort of currency and that it is you know for uh, drugs and to avoid government and so on. And the marketing is sort of guerrilla underground within Bitcoin circles where they you know they mock the other currencies like it's just Monero and Bitcoin are the good ones, but it's just another uh, altcoin. And it's just another, um, fundamentally, the real problem to go back, yeah, I'm not against competition. I'm happy with people competing about it. I just understand that the competition is going to lead to one winner necessarily, just like what happened in the 19th century. Because if you look at the 19th century, and I mentioned this in detail in my book, why did silver lose its role as money? And silver has lost its role as money. Don't let the silver bugs fool you. Silver has not been money for about 145 years, specifically from 1872. And the reason is, once Germany uh, shifted from silver to gold, there, there, there were many countries that were on gold and many countries that were on silver, but once Germany shifted to gold in 1872 after the Franco-Prussian War, 
the value of gold, that the value of wealth that was concentrated around gold was much larger, and then every other country had a much bigger incentive to switch to gold. And so the price of silver started to drop, and then everybody started to dump silver and move to gold. Fundamentally, at the end of the day, the only point of money is that you have one medium of exchange. So you exchange everything for it. So if there are two monies, everybody who's making a choice is incentivized to go with the one that is bigger. And that just means the bigger gets bigger and the small one gets smaller. So if you read the example of silver, and I include it in my book precisely for the uh, later lesson when it comes to altcoins, there can really be only one. So I'm not against com altcoins in the sense of, you know, I would like them to see them banned or I would want them to be banned. On the contrary, I'm very happy with anybody introducing them. And, you know, if somebody were to one day make me eat humble pie and um, really d introduce an altcoin that is better than Bitcoin, I would, you know, I'd be very embarrassed. But, you know, after I get over it, I'll probably be happy that we have something better than Bitcoin. But don't count on it. It's, you know, all the competent devs are improving on Bitcoin. And frankly, you know, no altcoin has the staying power f to, to compete with Bitcoin. No altcoin that has been around for more than uh, three or four years can, can compete with uh, Bitcoin in the long run. It's, um, you know, it's, it's gimmicks and it's marketing and so on, but it, it won't be able to survive, I think, in the long run. Nowadays, there's a very common idea. We see it every day in the, in the media. It's uh, the idea that what is important is not this Bitcoin thing, it's the underlying technology, yeah. the blockchain. And in your book, there's a sharp criticism of this idea. You, you say that this idea is a mantra that has been repeated ad nauseum between 2014 and 2017 by banking executives, journalists, and politicians who all share one thing in common, a lack of understanding of how Bitcoin actually works. And then in this chapter, you elaborate on two ideas. First, most of current blockchain projects are bullshit and are going to fail. And second idea, admittedly, there are some uses, use cases where blockchain is needed, but it will be the Bitcoin blockchain. So I have two questions. Why those current projects are bullshit and are going to fail? And second question, um, what use uh, cases would you mm -hmm. see that would need a blockchain that would not be the Bitcoin blockchain? Because the Bitcoin mm -hmm. blockchain would not be suitable. Okay. Um, the first question, the reason is very simple. Uh, the, uh, the success of Bitcoin meant a lot of people made a lot of money and a lot of people wanted to copy them and figure out why they made all this money. And so, you know, it, it became like the cargo cult science, where people just imitate the rituals of what Bitcoin does without understanding the underlying uh, mechanism. The only reason Bitcoin works is because the token itself, the Bitcoin itself, is valuable. This is what rewards the miners that secure the network. If you take out the token, which is all of these blockchain projects are doing, then you can no longer have a decentralized system and you can no longer have a system that is you know, um, immutable or any of those things. It's just, if, it's, if you take out the token, then you simply have a distributed ledger. And you know, distributed ledgers are not new. Google Docs had distributed ledgers, I think in 2005, they introduced it or something like that. And if you read the history of database technology, you know, it's since the 1970s and 80s, Companies, banks, people who run databases have had this ability of running a database shared between different locations. There's nothing new or important or revolutionary about being able to share a database. The only important revolutionary thing about Bitcoin is that you can share that database without having to trust any single individual. But the only way you do that is by having an entire monetary system lying with it. So unless you're willing to run a monetary system with proof of work and you know the expensive, massive cost that Bitcoin costs, I mean, um, ignore all of the pro-Bitcoin propaganda that tells you Bitcoin is cheap and affordable. It isn't. Bitcoin transactions are very expensive and they're only going to get more and more and more expensive because they're worth it. <laughs> because that's the only way that this system works. This is the only way that we can get hard money. So I'm uh, trying to run uh, the ledgers without the, 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 um, the, without the token won't work. So th the second question is what kind of contracts can or what kind of applications can work on Bitcoin? Whatever it is, if there's going to be an application that applies on a blockchain, it has to be only specifically about the token of the blockchain itself. 
because blockchains are not magic. It's not uh, magic that you can just you know throw it onto something and then things become immutable. It doesn't work that way. You know, for instance, people talk about let's say let's have real estate records listed on the on the blockchain, and then you can be sure they won't be forged. First of all, who's ever had a problem with their home ownership record ever getting forged? You know, did you ever walk home and find somebody else in your home and they tell you, hey, look, I have a new deed, I've forged it? It doesn't quite happen. It's not an issue. Why? Because fundamentally, even if we did have it on a, on a blockchain, it won't even matter because what determines your property right in your home is you, know, you having a gun to shoot somebody who comes in or you hiring somebody who has a gun or you know the police or whatever that's really what it comes down to enforcing the property right so if the police are going to come and shoot somebody for entering the house and they need to decide between you and the other guy who's in the house how are they going to decide they need their own record that's it so all that you need is one record you don't need the record of ownership distributed over millions of computers worldwide but more importantly it's pointless to do it because imagine imagine you know if you're uh, if you manage to hack into my computer and manage to steal the private key that includes my home record and then you manage to sell my home to yourself and now you own my home. You know, if you do that, with, if you took the private key, you know, what will the police do? Oh, sorry, sir, he took your private key, now he owns your home? No, it won't happen. What if you lose your private key? Your computer gets destroyed and you lose your private key. What do we do now with the house? Does the police come and say, sorry, you can't enter this house forever and nobody can enter this house because the private key is lost? You can't have that. Obviously, the ownership of the house is going to be determined by what the police decide or what the court decide or whatever. And these people don't need millions of records around the world. They just need one record with a couple of backups, and that's it. So it's completely insane to be running a system like Bitcoin that's very expensive, that then will get overrun anyway, because you know it doesn't matter if it gets if it gets hacked. You know you're not gonna. Or imagine you know the other f even funnier application when people talk about let's put the stock stocks on the blockchain. Okay, so then some Russian hacker hacks into Apple, and now he owns 20% of Apple stock. So because it's on the blockchain and it's irreversible, he gets to own 20% of Apple, that's it. You know, he gets to come to the shareholder meeting and vote for it? Obviously not. You know, the only way that the Bitcoin uh, blockchain works is because it's only the ownership of the token itself. And if it gets stolen, it's stolen, it's gone. Just like I stole money from your pocket or gold from your safe, it's gone. But with physical assets, there's no point in adding trustlessness to something that is by its nature built on trust in others. You have to trust in the CEO and the board and the employees of Apple if you're investing in them. And you have to trust in the police and the courts that are enforcing those laws and putting in them. And if you're just, and, and if you think that replacing it with a record on something that is immutable is going to replace all of that need for that trust, it won't, you know, it won't override the physical reality of the workers in the factory. And so any application that has to be done on a blockchain has to be with the token itself. And that's why when people talk about smart contracts, I think the only smart contracts that will make sense on blockchains, in my opinion, will be ones that involve the movement of the blockchain token. So multi-signature contract or, you know, um, delayed payments or things like that. I think it would just be basic stuff about payments. And this is why, you know, it's been eight, nine years now that we've had this and we've still not seen any examples of anything else. We've heard a lot of ideas, but none have been implemented commercially except for multi-signature and the basic Bitcoin smart contract suite uh, that, you know, just deals with the transactions of Bitcoin itself. I don't really think there's going to be much um, beyond that. People talk about, you know, time stamping and other kinds of applications. Perhaps but I, I, I'm skeptical that they'll find their value for the simple reason that Bitcoin blockchain is, Bitcoin block space is extremely expensive. It's extremely valuable. It costs about half a dollar or one dollar to send a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain today. So, um, you know, trying to put anything else that doesn't really need to be on the blockchain is not going to be very economical. You don't, most things in the world don't need to be written on thousands of computers all over the world repeating day, uh, you know, for, the, for all the rest of eternity. I don't see the use cases for that except in one use case that has proven itself, which is 
a monetary system, the basic infrastructure of a global monetary system that is neutral. And the only reason, in my opinion, that this matters is because, you know, it's not because Bitcoin is going to allow us cheap transactions or uh, cheaper visa or lower fees or whatever. It's because it destroys the ability of governments to run monetary policy. That's what's really valuable. You know, Bitcoin is not going to replace uh, Visa or MasterCard or Western Union. Bitcoin is going to make inflation impossible. And it's going to make government finance through inflation impossible. It's going to make things like the Iraq war impossible. You know, if the American people had to pay for the Iraq war up front, if they had to put hard money up front to go and kill Iraqis, they wouldn't have done it. The fact is that American foreign policy runs because it runs on an infinite supply of dollars. And that's why it can go around all around the world. It's going to make things like Venezuela impossible. It's going to make things like Zimbabwe impossible. That's why Bitcoin is worth it. That's why it's going to be worth it as it continues to grow in its value to the point where it's consuming an enormous amount of electricity and each transaction might even get to the point where it costs thousands of dollars in transaction fees. It's, it would be better, obviously, economically, if you think about it, it would be cheaper to just run a trusted system in strict terms. But then if you think about the second order effects of running a trusted system that relies on trust in governments, you just look at all of the death toll of the 20th century and you have to compare that. And that's what Bitcoin gets rid of. It gets rid of the possibility of world wars carrying on forever because governments can finance themselves forever. And that is worth it. I struggle to see how any other use case could justify using a blockchain that consumes so much energy. Putting land registry on a DLT, not a, on the blockchain, but on, on a DLT, has some uh, economical advantages. It's faster, it's uh, cheaper, uh, mo maybe more robust. And uh, it's not a revolution, but it is a, a nice evolution. And I think companies are going to go into this direction. But we've had the digital, uh, we've had DLTs, uh, distributed ledgers, since 1980. Doesn't no, but I mean, the, you know, the, 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 I, the calling something from 1980 a blockchain doesn't really... Um, ma make a lot of sense. There's nothing new that Bitcoin is adding from this and it's not going to be employed on a blockchain. Central banks and banks and agencies, they run shared databases where they update them with one another. And there's software for that that has existed long before Bitcoin. Okay, one last question, please. Hi, you just mentioned before an example of threat to Bitcoin, which is capital control by government mm -hmm. and forbidding change from fiat to, um, to Bitcoin. Another threat that I see as much more dangerous would be an attack to the security model, mm -hmm. like nationalize mi miners, nationalize manufacturers of mining equipment. Mm -hmm. And that would actually work quite easily because they are so centralized. It's only, today, it's only about one or two miners in China, all the um, sorry, mining man manufacturers in China. Same for miners, it's just yeah. a few of them. And that, I mean, I would see this as quite an easy attack and on the network. What would be your, your comment on that? Well, my, my answer to that is similar to the original one, which is that it's, the problem with it is that, you know, technically it might seem like it makes sense, but economically it just, again, flies against economic incentives to the point that I don't think it will be uh, feasible. And specifically, um, just think of it this way. You know, if, if a government decided that they wanted to control an en enough amount of mining to attack the network, I mean, I think they might have been able to pull that off I would say maybe 2015, 16 at the latest. I think it might be too late. Now, I might be wrong. But the, the problem, I think, is after Bitcoin has grown to this point right now, is that Bitcoin is the, is, is the most profitable use of processing power in the world that we have right now. So it's at the forefront of processing power development. And even though you can buy individual miners, you cannot stop others from manufacturing mining equipment. And so mine, you know, manufacturing mining equipment is becoming uh, more and more common of an industry. So you know, factories can do it underground if it comes down to it, and people can mine underground, and there's, it's very, very hard to spot where the miners are. So in the case of, you know, if, imagine if a government says, we're going to acquire enough hash power to keep attacking Bitcoin. What the, you know, in, in, in a static sort of non-economic way of thinking of it, you know, you think of it as like a war, then we just get all the miners and then we attack the other miners. But economics doesn't work like that. If you think about how it's actually going to happen, they're going to be investing billions in developing new mining equipment. 
But what is that actually going to do? It's going to provide more capital for mining manufacturers. It's going to raise the profitability. It's going to invite more money into mining. So, you know, $5 billion from the US government tomorrow to attack Bitcoin, dedicated towards attacking Bitcoin, will just, <laughs> funnily enough, increase the security of Bitcoin because they're going to make miners. And while they're putting the miners online, you know, the, the hash power continues to grow because of all the money that they're investing. And the hash power that they don't control continues to grow. They can't stop that from growing. So if they need five billion today, you know, by the time they built all those miners, they are, they're much less. So my point is that it's, it's very hard for one um, entity to be able to beat the market particularly if that entity is not motivated by profit. You see, you know, if you have a government program to run a minor project, you can't, that doesn't mean that everybody else stops. So all that happens is other people will start producing more and more and more mining equipment. And then we get an arms race. And most likely we'll have several people producing and the end result is more and more hash rate. Having said that, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't completely rule it out. I think the realistic scenario is, you know, keep producing miners with back doors and that governments can control and then surprise people by um, at using them to attack the network. But I doubt it will be successful fundamentally because of the economic incentives. It's just always so much more money will be left on the table. Securing the network is very profitable and so attacking it is just going to, uh, is not going to change that. I think there will always be more incentives for it. Unfortunately, we have to conclude. And as a way of concluding, I would like to quote a phrase of your book. Uh, you, you write, many Bitcoiners have developed quasi-religious beliefs in the ability of Bitcoin to survive come what may. So, Saifuddin, you are probably aware that that's the way yourself may be described by Ethereum maximalists. But at the same time, later in the chap chapter, you, you write, uh, it's possible that Bitcoin is going to grow, but it's also possible that Bitcoin will stagnate or even fail and disappear. And you explain why. So I think that this book shows that your vision is quite balanced and rigorous. And I want you to thank you for thank sharing you. this vision for us and coming in Paris, talking about Bitcoin. Thank you, Saifi. Thank you very much, Eric.